Um, I just want to say it's, it really is an honor to be here speaking at, at a university, University of Nevada, Reno. Um, yeah, imagining my life when I was in college that I would be traveling around the country talking about the work that I make, how I make it, participating in, in workshops and firings, I, I really feel you know, it's, it's a gift from somewhere. I, I'm not sure where, but it's, it's really an honor. And we have to thank, uh, we've mentioned um, Casey, who's been really, really awesome. I'd never met Casey before, and he set this deal up. He was on the, on the ground here in Reno. Uh, Sutter and Sam at the Wedge. If you haven't been to the Wedge, it is an amazing ceramic studio, a place to learn about clay, a place to hang out with really, really good people. It's a, a young institution, but I think it's going to be, become a really, really great, great institution, not just in Reno, but possibly the whole West and the, and the country. They, they've got a really good vibe going there. And then... Someone who you don't, may, many of you don't know or have just gotten to know recently is Rob Lamb, who is from Portland, Oregon, but he has a place out on the road up to Lake Tahoe, for lack of a better description of where it is, but 10 miles out of town here. He's got a beautiful anagama there, and he really wants to get people at the wedge into wood firing up there from time to time, but he went above and beyond to make this happen. I, I, Rob, I can't thank you enough for, for doing this. Great, great guy. Get, get to know him if you get a chance. Um, you, you won't regret it. Uh, all right, so yeah, my name's John Dix. I'm from Michigan, uh, Flint, Michigan, the, the, the infamous city that, that is in and out of the news, uh, mostly for bad reasons recently. Um, I grew up there. I went to college to a small private liberal arts school that happened to have a very good ceramics program. And I um, was interested in art, but I had never made pots before I, I went to college. And I very quickly found myself in the pot shop with people that I, I really enjoyed being around. And, just started making, working in clay. Um, after I graduated from college, I uh, went and did an apprenticeship with a, with a functional potter, a person who fired a gas kiln. And he taught me, probably more than anybody, the real tools of how to make pots very, very efficiently, quickly, but with, with a sense of, of freedom as well. So his name is Peter Johnson, not a, not a famous potter. Um, I started grad school, and after a summer of apprenticing, I, I did a year of grad school and didn't really enjoy it very much. I, I, I realized that I had been going high school, college, about to try to get my master's, and it was boom, boom, boom and felt like I was just moving too quickly down, down that road. And I dropped out of grad school, went back to work for Peter for a little while, saved money, and went to Europe. And I thought I'd be in Europe for maybe six months. I had $1,000. I flew into London. I hitchhiked down to Greece. And I had this image of, this was 1985, so there was no internet. And I used to go to the library and look at pictures of Europe. And I, I got this image of Greece as being the most beautiful place on the planet. And uh, so I went there. And I was hoping I could stay for a little while and travel back up through Europe, maybe. And, um, but I met a potter there. And he said, yeah, if you need work, um, I can give you some work. So pretty quickly, I, I made some friends, uh, started working in this pottery, and spent the summer in Greece. Then I went from Greece to Israel, and I spent a year in Israel working with, I was on a kibbutz, but working with, with the potter on the kibbutz. And I realized that the, the, the skills that I had learned working as, as an apprentice were really good 
traveling skills. And, and besides making pots, traveling has, has always been a sort of a passion of mine. Um, and I spent a year in Israel and ended up traveling through Asia, India, Nepal, Tibet, a few other places. Went back to America and went back to working with Peter in Michigan, the, the potter I studied under, and still had the itch to travel some more and decided I would go to Japan where there was, I, I had always been interested in, in wood fire ceramics. So I'm going to get going on the slideshow and that brings me up to when I moved to Japan. And I went to Japan in 1989. Again, I thought I'd go for a year or two and look at the ceramics there. And I think people who don't know about Japanese ceramics think of Asian ceramics as being sort of ornate, beautiful, very sort of high-tech, intellectually uh, uh, gorgeous piece of, piece of pottery. And I look at that and I, I also sort of have the same, same feeling. But what took me to Japan wasn't that type of work, but was this. And this was something that I saw in a book when I was in university, and it's, it's an old Shigaraki jar. Shigaraki is one of the famous pottery villages in Japan. It's very, you know, it's very well known in Japan and in, in, the, in the ceramics world. And I just remember looking at that piece and thinking it was both, kind of, you know, it's broken, it's not beautiful, but there's something very, very deep and moving. It moved me. And the fact that there was a book of these old jars that weren't made as art, but it, now there's a big picture book of it, it just got my mind sort of wondering about it. And you know, there felt, I felt something very deep and beautiful. And, and then I started looking into how it was made. And it was made with these old style kilns that's called an anagama. Ana means whole and kama means kiln. So they're old whole kilns that used to be dug out of the side of a, mount, of a clay mountain and going up and the chimney would go out the back. It wasn't even really a chimney. It was just the way it was dug out of the mountain. And they were the first high temperature kilns that, that, would, that would fire stoneware to uh, what we call cone nine or about 2,400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And they're very inefficient kilns. So to get them up to temperature, they're burning wood, of course. So to get them up to temperatures, they would deposit copious amounts of ash on the pieces. That ash would melt into a very natural, natural glaze. Well, throughout history, kilns, like anything, have become more and more efficient. This type of kiln turned into this type of kiln, which is called a climbing kiln. Still going up a hill, still burning wood, but this kiln will burn a lot less wood and will not put so much ash on your pot. So if you're making a pot with, with clay or if you're making a pot with, with really nice design, you don't want a bunch of crud or drippy things. You want to control it. And so from that kiln, which was much more efficient, we've come up to today where we now have gas kilns and we have electric kilns. And these are super great machines. I mean, the electric kiln, you push a button and it'll heat your pot up to right where you want it and the glaze will melt and it'll come out perfect. Uh, gas kilns are also fantastic because it has flame and fire and you can control the atmosphere. Potters are always talking about the atmosphere, the, the air, whether it's a uh, reductive atmosphere or an ox heavy oxygen atmosphere. And with gas, you can cut back the amount of oxygen, get a dirty flame, and it changes the clay, it changes the glaze. So that's what most modern potters use these. And you know, maybe most sensible potters use these. Uh, but at the same time, you cannot get effects like this. And this is a, this is a large piece that I made. It's, it's a hand-built um, 
in Japanese it's called a tsuba, which is sort of a large, they used to be storage jars for rice or, or soy sauce or oils or whatever. This is a, a more modern interpretation of, of that, that form. And you can see how there was no glaze on this piece. All the, all the decoration just came from the ash, from burning a lot of wood and the ash collecting on that piece and eventually melting and running down it. And it was stacked sideways to get that ash to look like it's running diagonally across the pot. It actually ran straight. It, the, the, the ash drips by the way gravity dictates. Um, but what the Japanese did was throughout history as kilns improved, uh, glazes and clays got more refined and more beautiful. They, about five, six hundred years ago, based partially on the tea ceremony, this a different idea of beauty emerged. And that idea of beauty was something that is imperfect, something that really combines the element of clay just dug out of the ground and ash just on it, no, very little refinement. And pieces like this, this is one of the most famous pots in Japan, it was made in the Momoyama era, which is about 500 years ago. It was like uh, late 1500s into the early 1700s, I think. And that's an, an Iga water jar. It's, the name of it's uh, Yabure Bukura, which means broken bag. And it's, you know, it's just one of these iconic pieces that, you know, it's both incredibly ugly and incredibly fascinating at the same time. And that's in the National Museum in Tokyo and is one of the most revered pieces in, in Japan. And again, that aesthetic, the, the tea ceremony kept that aesthetic alive from when kilns could have gone to extremely, you know, Japanese are pretty high tech people, uh, but they also, that aesthetic has carried on through today. And it came into America, I think, in the 1960s, when, when ceramics went through kind of a revolution, much like modern art, where it went from craft to art to abstract art, uh, these kilns were very appealing to certain artists here in America, and it started a boom and a revolution of, of these, these uh, wood fire kilns here in America. And I think the first ones were built out east in New Jersey in like the, the mid-1970s, and now there are thousands of them all over the, the country. And this little baby here is the one just outside of Reno, Rob's Kiln, and it's very much based on uh, the original designs of an anagama, and it, it just a beautiful little kiln. Um, and talking about the aesthetics a little bit more, you know, these are three pieces of mine that are about, each one's about this tall, and again, it's, What's important to me is trying to bring out that, that, that natural feel of the clay, the earth, the, the, the crumpliness of, of, a, of a craggy rocker, uh, and, and, and then you put it in the kiln. The interesting thing about the, the way that we fire pots and thinking of it as an, as an artist, I don't know an art where you, you make something and then you sort of give it up to a process where you lose control of it with the idea that it's going to come back better than you could have done it yourself. And that giving it up, it, it, it's kind of insane, but it's, it's incredibly rewarding. It can be incredibly soul-destroying as well when it, when it doesn't work out. But, and we'll talk about the firing process because it's not an easy thing. It's, it's a very labor intensive, it takes a lot of people working together, but um, the, it, 
what it gives back to you is really, really something, something wonderful when it, when it works out. It's another little basket for him. So you can kind of see my work has that influence of, you know, I think it's got a Japanese influence, it's got a Western influence, and there's sort of a, a I say the abstract expressionist, I don't see myself as an abstract artist, but there's a feel of, my, my favorite painters were Jackson Pollock or William de Kooning, where they're, they, you know, you just imagine them attacking the canvas. They're, they're recording an, an event that, that they're doing right there. So the painting is as much a statement of what happened when, when, when they were doing this as it is a beautiful piece of art that, that will live forever. It's, it, it, it wasn't all um, cerebral calculation. It was, came from the gut as much as it, it came from the, from the, from the head. And that's kind of how I try to approach a lot of my work. It's, it's, it's gestural. It's, it's, um, it, it comes, you know, just an aggressive attack, not attacking the clay, but um, a little bit different approach to working with, with clay the, the, the way that I work with clay. All right, so I think now I'm going to walk you through a firing. And, and it's not just one firing. It's going to be showing loading the kiln, firing the kiln, and give you an idea of, of what happens. This is my kiln in Japan, and you can see it's not quite as pretty as, as uh, Rob's here in Reno, and it's made out of a lot of different brick. It's got steel support. Um, that's the inside of the kiln. So we'll, it takes me five days to load my kiln, and and then it takes six or seven days to fire it. It took us two days. My kiln's a little bit bigger than Rob's, and I'm, when I'm loading my own work, it takes me a lot more time. You have to think of every piece, how you place it in that kiln. The fire runs in one direction, and you know, I'll show you a couple more. <laughs> this is loading uh, Rob's kiln last, last week. So if you look at these pieces, we're thinking very much the fire is coming from the, the perspective of the camera, and it's going to hit those pieces. The flame's going to hit it, go around it, and the ash is going to get deposited on the top of those pieces, and then it's going to melt and run south or run down. So every piece of pottery you put in, you think of it as what do you think should be the front? Where do you want the ash to fit? Do you want it to run this way? Do you want it to go this? Do you want the flame to go this way? So it, it, some of the most important de decisions you make about how that piece is going to look is how you load it into the kiln. These are bowls. Uh, each one has a different glaze on it, and by stacking them like that, one, it's more efficient. You get more pots in the same space, but also the flame is going to move around it, and there'll be ash on the front, of, front face of all of those, and then the back sides where it's protected will just be the natural uh, glaze color. So th hopefully there'll be a lot of drama in each one of those pieces by, by stacking them that way. That's ending up loading the kiln. You know, it, it takes a team of a lot of different people to, to load and fire these kilns. And it, it's, I cannot tell you how wonderful it is for me to come to a new place where I don't know anybody and get together and, on a project like this. And everybody's in it. I mean, part of the thing of, of being a... a wood fire potter, an anagama fire. The work is really important, but we also live for, for this experience. And firing these kilns, it's, you know, it's like a community of people, and it's like a journey that you know, you're five, six, seven, eight, nine days working together, hard together. It's, you know, it's like you cast off, and you're at sea, and you come back, 
and you know, sometimes it's the love boat and sometimes it's the Titanic. It's can, you, and more often than not, it's good, but there's always tension. They're not easy to fire, and, and we'll talk more about that as we go, but um, you know, a little technical thing. You see that, oh, I've got a pointer. Let me use this gadget. Ah. This thing right here is called a cone pack, and as m many of you know, but you know, people often ask, how do you tell the temperature in a kiln? And these things, you see three going this way, and I think four going that way. Each of those are engineered to melt at a specific temperature, and they all have numbers. And so there's like cone 06, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Each one of those melts at a specific temperature, and they, they just go over like this, hopefully, during the, uh, during the firing. Uh, and then you can see how tightly pots are packed here. So after it's loaded, the, the, the kiln's all packed up and sealed, and we put wood, start out at the bottom, and then we start stoking at the top after so many days. Again, the firing takes about six days, five or six days, and we work in shifts. So six-hour shifts is what we did at Rob's. It's kind of what I do at mine as well. Most people who, who fire these things, if they're not religious, they're at least superstitious. And my superstitions, uh, well, the, the, this a traditional Japanese thing is you put salt and sake at the top of the kiln. You keep the sake full for the whole firing. I have a, a close friend of mine who every firing, firings are kind of events. I do two or three times a year, and he comes around and helps. And he looks at the people there, he kind of thinks about the mood, and then he names every firing. And he does a calligraphy, a, a, you know, kind of a cool calligraphy. And we hang it right when we're about to light the kiln. We put Shiro sign up. And they're always kind of goofy names. It's like mature combustion. Or it, in English, they sound, sound funny. In Japanese, come and they look at it. And they, they don't get it either. But uh, it's, it's, it's fun to do. <coughs> then we, we light a little fire at the, at the mouth of the kiln. And we go very, very slowly uh, as we heat up the kiln. We start with a fire outside of the kiln. We don't want big flames going into the kiln because a big flame hits a big pot, it'll crack it. Uh, so you really have to baby it up. The, the, you know, electricity, it's, it's all around it. It's very even. Gas kilns also, very, very even. You can fire up to our, the temperature that we go to in you know, eight, 10 hours if you want. We, it takes us two, three days just to get to temperature, then we try to hold temperature. This is when it's at temperature and we're, we're stoking into the kiln here. Wood, it takes a lot of wood to, to fire these kilns. Um, in Japan, there are guys that, that make a living just splitting wood for the potters there. There's so many people firing these kilns. And this is uh, Tamura-san, and he gets probably more of my money than just about anybody. He, uh, it's expensive uh, firing these kilns. I also have a guy who tears down old Japanese houses, and he, he gives me these beautiful beams, hand-hewn, you know, post and peg pieces with, that he just takes down with a crane. He has to pay as a commercial, what, house destroyer to, to pay to throw away this wood. So he's more than happy to give me um, you know, th this wood here. And I've got to chop it up and, and burn it. And it's, it can be a little um, distressing how, how beautiful some of these pieces are. And I, ha I, I have culled a lot of nice pieces away. And I'm building a new studio that I'll, I'll show you in a, uh, just a couple pictures of later. Um, this is one technique that we do that's called hikidashi in Japanese. And a lot of the terms for wood-fired pottery 
come from Japan because they've been doing it forever and it's quite new to us. So uh, Americans, Westerners often look to Japan and we don't have words for the things that, that we're doing now. So we, we learn the Japanese words and, and they stick. So, and hikidashi is kind of like raku, if you, if you know about, about that. And it's a, a matter of pulling a hot pot out of the kiln at, this is at peak temperature, and cooling it very, very quickly. And we do that for, the main reason is, is you get, when it's good, you get very, very interesting pots that, is quite, that are quite different than if you had left them in the kiln. That's pulling, and you can see the, how I have to dress to, to get those pots out. And then that's it cooling, cooling more. You can see the charcoal still in it, and the, and the color starts to come out. This piece was half buried in the ember pile. So if you imagine a, a bonfire, and you burn a bonfire all night, you end up with a big bed of coals. Well, imagine that by times a thousand, and that's how much wood we burn, and the ember pile that is in, inside the kiln has incredible power. And a lot of the, the, the best pieces are the ones that get buried under this ember pile, and it's what we call the high-risk, high-reward area. A lot of those pieces end up broken. They get shifted around because we're putting wood, hopefully right next to the pieces. Often they end up hitting, stuff gets shifted around, but the pieces that come out of that area tend to be the ones that, that we sort of covet them, that, that really are the most exciting because we have the least control of how they're going to look. Um, whoops, <laughs> that's the button. That's uh, just stoking wood into the kiln. There you can see the cones bending now. So we're looking in through the door, and we're looking at those cones, and we, we want those to go over, except maybe the last one you want to just keep a little soft. And it's often not easy to reach high temperature in these kilns. It can be very, very tricky. Um, I often equate it to climbing Mount Everest. Like any knucklehead can get up to 7,000, well 7,000 meters isn't easy either, but almost anybody can fire a kiln and get it up to 2,000 degrees. You, you would just figure it out, 2,200 degrees. The last 100 degrees, sometimes the last 50 degrees can just be a nightmare and you can be stuck at this point and you wonder why you try, you got a whole bag of tricks of different things, you try to get it up and just like, you know, they always say that last 100 meters of, of Mount Everest is where most, a majority of the people die, or they get right up to that point, and they can see the top, but weather, weather, weather really isn't a factor for us, but for, uh, as an analogy, that, that last 100 meters can often, you know, people just give up and turn back, and, you know, how soul-destroying is that? Well, most people who fire with wood have had that experience where you get up so close and for whatever reason you don't make it and, and it haunts you for, for, <laughs> for the rest of your life. Uh, but the more you do it, the more you, 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 I mean, I haven't had that experience in a long, long time, but you typically have an experience where the kiln stalls and you wrestle with it and you struggle and eventually you make it and it's a great, great feeling of, of of it when you make it. This is my kiln. We have a little tea house back behind our, our uh, behind the kiln. That's Rob's kiln the other night. Uh, incredibly beautiful. They're very quiet. It just, you know, it, it looks chaotic, but it's really a very peaceful, quiet experience when, when you're firing these kilns. At my kiln, when, when, we, when we're finished firing, the last stoke, we rip the sign down that Shiro made, we roll it around the piece of wood, 
and whoever I felt did a, did a bang up job at, at the kiln gets to stoke the last piece with, with the, the calligraphy name into the kiln. Uh, this is closing up Rob's kiln. You'll often damper it down, you'll, you'll shut down the chimney, do a big stoke and flame just screams out of every place and you, you just, you close it up as tight as you can. You don't want air going in. You want it to cool as slowly as possible. And then you chill out and maybe have a drink if you, if, if you drink. And uh, yeah, sort of, it, it's a really good feeling when, when you finish a firing and it's done and there's nothing else to do except uh, just relax. That was yesterday, was it? Yeah. <laughs> this guy here, John built the kiln, and he's from Taos, and he left this morning, and he's catching a flight to Thailand tomorrow morning for a month. So he's, uh, he's got a few journeys both behind him and ahead of him. Good, good dude. All these guys are great. I mean, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know either of these guys, and... and Casey was incredible to fire with, and John was, was a hoot as well. So, and, and Rob, yeah, I don't know what else to say, it was a great, great experience. And four, five, six days later, you come back, you leave the kiln, and you take down the door and you see, see what you got. And I talked about that ember bed where, where the pots are being fired right in where, where it's just, the, the charcoal is just burning. And this is that area. So you go in and you dig around and these pots are buried under ash now. And you, you're kind of looking for diamonds in the dust. You can see I've got a, I'm loosening up a piece here that's gonna come out. And it's, it's always the underside of those pieces that, that can be pretty spectacular and you know, the light's not so good on this but when I lifted it up I looked at it and I knew I had a winner it was um, a, a darling little piece I'm not sure it might be a photograph of it later I'm not sure but um, this also is just you, know, you can just see how we're gonna have to chip pieces out but um, pieces stacked this is the cone pack basically you know every cone is down hard Puddled is the term we use. Um, further back in my kiln, is, it fires a bit cooler, so I do a lot of glazeware in the back. And you know, these are cups and bowls, and that's cone 10 down and 11 over. For, now, this is my place in Japan. I'm going to talk, a, we're going to change the topic a little bit. I, again, I, I've been very, very fortunate with, with meeting different people as, I, as I've traveled through my life. And my, my kiln is part of a project that is sort of a larger project of different little rural developments in different countries of the world. And the, the project is, it, it's called Fieldwork, and it's not a big uh, organization at all. It's, it's started and run by an, an English man and his Japanese wife, and they're about late 70s. And they, they've lived in, well, David has lived in Japan most of his adult life, and when he retired, he wanted to start a project of rural rural redevelopment or encouraging people where, where rural areas have been. Japan's famous for, for young people leaving the rural areas and going to the city. And his idea is to, to develop places in rural areas and try to get people to come back out. And I met David in 1995, actually, January 16th, 1995, which is a rather uh, important date. Um, I went out, looked at this property, and talked about, he talked about wanting to, to um, 
enable somebody, preferably not a Japanese person because they have many opportunities, but a foreign person who had a drive to do something, and he wasn't even thinking ceramics, but that area is, is Tamba, which is a, one of the very famous areas for ceramics. And he thought, yeah, that the pottery sounds good. And you know, if you'd like to take this on, we have money to, to build a kiln. Eventually, we'd like to have a studio. And we'd like it to be a place where it's not just about me, but about bringing other people into it for, for an experience and getting people from different countries to communicate about something. And here it'll be communicate about clay. They also have a place in uh, Scotland. They own this old, this is an old carriage house to a big manor. The thing looks like Downton Abbey, if any of you ever watched that program. Uh, but what they, what they bought was the carriage house and the workers' quarters. There were a couple of standalone apartments. They've developed that into uh, a rural study center where anybody can go and stay there for like 10 or $15 a, a night and study. You know, it's, it, it's out in the boondocks of Scotland, incredibly you know, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, another picture of it. Uh, and then another project they have is in Bangladesh. They, they support a, an orphanage for, for girls up in the hill country that where, it, where it borders Burma and they're, well, talk more about that, but so they've, they've also got a place in Hong Kong on one of the rural islands of Hong Kong and in each place they're helping people do something kind of like I'm doing in Japan. So I, I was very, very fortunate. Um, I built the kiln and then David and Sachko, the, the, the fieldwork project had money to build the studio, and my studio's down here. Um, this is a sort of a large kitchen dining room. And then upstairs, there's a, well, this is a new building that, we're, that we've just started to build. Well, not just started, we're actually having the opening in April. Uh, April 24th, if anybody's in the neighborhood, please, please come by. And this building, I've been building mostly by myself, though I had a friend from New York who was a professional builder come over and help me do the post and beam. He came over for two months and he knew what he was doing. I'm on YouTube every night looking how to hang drywall, okay? Uh, things like that. But he knew how to get the whole structure up and the, the night before he flew back to New York, we laid, laid the ridge beam in the top of the of the structure, but you can see these, these old beams that I said I get and then I mostly burn. I, I've kept a lot aside and did a, this post and beam structure and you know it's close to being finished. Um, it's got a loft over here. And it's going to be a multi-use place so that when people want to come from abroad, there'll be a place to make pots, there'll be a place to do a slideshow, there'll be place for people to, to give small workshops or talks. We have you know, different ideas for using it. And then there's a loft area up here, which will be both additional sleeping space, maybe a library or a relaxing area. This is the tatami room above. That, this room is, is up here. And this is where people sleep now. It's a kind of a traditional Japanese room. The, the, these mats are called tatami mats. And you'll, if you ever go real estate hunting in, in Japan, they, they measure rooms by the number of mats. So this is a, uh, a 14 or 16 mat room. I can't remember what. But if you look at a, a Japanese apartment, I'll say it's got a six mat, a 4.5, and a kitchen. And that tells you two rooms of, of the size of the kitchen. Um, you throw your futon down there and, and, and sleep. I have a house in Kobe and a studio in Kobe also. And Kobe's about an uh, hour and 15 minutes from the studio out here. And I spend about, typically about half the week in the city. I teach some pottery classes there. I've got a studio. I've got a very small studio behind my house in Kobe. And my wife and son live there. So 
I'm going between the two. I've got the, you know, it's nice. I'm in the city and I'm in the country. And when I mentioned the date, January 16th, uh, 1995, the day I met David in Sachko was the day before the, the big Kobe earthquake. So I was out here, I went back to Kobe. The next morning, my house, my whole neighborhood, the whole city uh, fell down around me. Um, but a lot of people left Japan because of that. I decided to stay I, um, because of this opportunity. But it was sort of a, an odd coincidence uh, to, to, to meet David, get this offer, and then the next day have this earthquake hit. Um, oh. That's my uh, kiln shed down here. This is sort of a, a perspective from the, the studio up on the hill. You have to go down across a little creek and down to the kiln. We have a, a, a shrine right next to us. This is not our building. Our property runs along here. And that's a, I mean, that building's not that beautiful, but it's a very, very beautiful little shrine tucked in there that gets used probably a half a dozen times a year. People come and, and uh, um, do, it, it, it feeds two little villages that, that were nearby. Um, and they, they have events maybe half a dozen times a year there. But it's, it, have, it has a very feeling of, of seclusion. Like you, you don't get in Japan. I don't think I could have stayed in, in Japan as long as I have. So I grew up in Michigan. I spent a lot of time in, in, the, in the north of Michigan, in the woods and around the lakes. And being in a big city, I, I, I get a real cramped feeling. And I love big cities, but I also really love, love the countryside. Um, OK. Now we're just going to look at pots for a little while and, and, and look at what my work looks like. And um, that'll be most of it. I have a short video. Don't let me forget to play the video. It's kind of funny or entertaining uh, at the end of this. But again, this, this, these, this is a large jar, two sides of it, that was fired on its side so that um, the way that ash runs, it, we use seashells to support work. And the, the seashells don't melt, but when you bring it out of the kiln, it turns to powder. I forget what's the, how do you, how do you explain that? Anyone? They get calcined, which means? The shell becomes water soluble after it's fired, so it's sort of just easy to wash it off. Right, so it comes out, it still looks like a shell, and then the, the, you either soak it in water or you, um, just the air, the humidity of the air, it just turns to powder in, in an hour or so when you just brush it off or, and then scrub it off. And what, what it, it works kind of like a mold so that when the ash runs down into it, it fills up those. Typic, typically, we use shells with, with those things, um, ridges across, across the backs of them. And the, the glaze or the ash will fill those up, and it, it's like a mold. Then that, that calcine falls off, and you have what remains is really just the ash or the glaze, but it's been in that shell and makes. You know, it makes beautiful, beautiful natural marks on the, on the pieces. And it also separates work. It's very important that work doesn't touch each other in the kiln. And so like this piece was fired face down and got buried under the ash pile. That's where you get these beautiful, what we call a reduction blue. It's just from being buried under this ember pile and the oxy oxygen just constantly being sucked out of the air by the burning fire around it. it. Gives these wonderful blue colors. And then the ash just slowly drips around it. This one was glazed with a, with a white glaze, but the ember pile just came to here and giving that, that lovely contrast between the, the, the black and the, the white. That's a large kind of sculptural form about that high, made with two slabs together. And I 
just ripped a hole and it was fired face down. That piece is in the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art now. I'm proud of it. It's a basket form that I've done. Uh, that's actually the one that we saw pulled out of the fire earlier. And it's, it's a form that I, that I really enjoy. It's, it, in Japan, uh, f Japanese flower arranging is, is one of the arts that people study. And, and a form like this, if you ever see Japanese flower arranging, just very simple, you know, a flower, something long, some two or three things very strategically placed, and boom, you know, the whole world is, is, is in it. And this piece of like a little flower coming out, a little something coming up this way, it, it really, uh, the flowers make that incredibly beautiful. And I think that that piece also m brings something out of the flowers. Uh, it's one of my favorite forms to make. And yeah, um, there's an even uglier one. And, and they often come out looking like, you know, craggy old men or something. But it, it, to me, it, it captures something that, that I, I, I find both just very intriguing. I don't beautiful, you can say, but um, I call these flasks, and they're bottle forms that are that are flat on both sides, and that was fired face down in the and again buried in the ember pile, and these are the ones that you know we have no idea how it's going to look when they come out. We just but we think it could out come out really really nice. And this is a dynamite one where you get the contrast of the black into this sort of midnight blue. This is where it was supported on shells and it, it goes that, that orange color. That crack was actually, a, I ripped a slab of clay in two and joined it back together so it, it would look like a crack or you know, some sort of a, a rip through the, through the clay. Uh, but it, you know, it, it the idea is that it, it looks like it's made by man, but it looks like it might have been under the ocean for a long time, and a maybe found object that was buried under, underground uh, is the look I'm going for, I guess. That's a little bottle. Again, no glaze on this piece. That color just comes from the, the ash and the interaction with, with this rough clay. That flask form has, has gone in different directions where I, I paddle it more aggressively and, and get a much more um, out of sort of a, a real sort of flask canteen shape into a much more organic looking, looking piece. And it, it, they really develop as I make them. It, it, it's, the shapes just sort of evolve as I paddle them. It's, they're quite fun, fun to make. That was a hikidashi piece pulled out of the fire and cooled quickly. And it's a, a pretty big one. Um, and I often do, you know, pieces that are, that are partly thrown, partly hand-built, assembled, uh, become, becoming much more sculptural than, than uh, utilitarian. These are even more organic. They're, they're not thrown. They're just clay that I, I slam on the ground. I cut. I slam again. I cut and, uh, until I get a shape that I like. And uh, Same process. Tea ceremony. If you know anything about Japan, the, the tea ceremony is what has carried this aesthetic through for, for you know, 500 years. And these vessels, this is called a, a mizusashi or a water jar, and it's, it's used in the tea ceremony. And, and things that are made for the tea ceremony have a, has a higher value. They're, they're sort of the most revered pieces of ceramics in possibly the world. Uh, and this would be a, a tea bowl for where they, they make tea for the tea ceremony and will serve, serve in that. 
That's a hikigoro, for, uh, which we made out uh, last week. Um, another tea ball, hikidashi, a shino glazed tea ball, which is one of the favorite glazes for, for wood kilns because it's, it's a glaze that can stand a range of temperature and it can stand a lot of ash and can really be completely different in different places of, in, in the kiln. Another water jar. Platters that I do, um, those are actually thrown on the wheel and then stretched out into long, long platters. I think there are many of them being made now at, at, at the wedge. These are uh, cold sake servers. They're, uh, you know, again, things for sake are, is, is a big market in Japan, obviously. And if you, if you do drink sake, you, you learn pretty quickly that, that hot sake is usually not very good sake. And good sake you put in your refrigerator and you drink it cold. And you tend to serve it out of a more open bowl form with, a, with, with some sort of pouring spout. So those are you know, quite things that potters make in, in Japan. That's another one where, where with a very thick glaze that, that dripped down in that you know, sort of crazy stalactite, stalagmite, which one comes from the top? Stalactite uh, from the handle. Uh, and then these are sake bottles for hot sake. And again, no glaze on these pieces, just from the fire. It's a sake cup. Now, the thing is about, just about that big, but it's a precious little, beautiful little cup. Those are four sake cups. All just, with, well, this bottom one was glazed, but, um, you know, you can see the shells and the, and they're, they're just wonderful little objects to hold in your hand and, and turn around and drink from and catch a little buzz. That's, uh. <laughs> These are the shinos that we talk about. And I think you saw before uh, you know, how red this is. The same glaze might go white and dry in a different part of the kiln. Here it goes a sort of soft, velvety, red color. Um, these are plates, again, with a shino glaze. Uh, this is what I was talking about where you saw those bowls stacked. And here are where there were shells to separate the bowls from, from each other. And then this is up on the sort of windward side, up the fire is coming from the top, ash is being deposited here, and then it breaks around the piece and washes out the back. So this side is very, the clean color of the glaze, and this is where, where the ash is. And you know, these, um, you know, these are the, the kind of effects that you get out of a wood kiln that, that are difficult to get out of other kilns. Uh, this is the last pot we're going to look at, and this is, this is made by a, a, a local potter that, that comes around and steals my clay, I think. This piece, this piece is about that big, and it's made by what I think in, in America is called a mud dauber. We call it a, a clay bee, a, a tsuchibachi, which is a, it's like a, it, it's made by a bee, and it's a house that he lives in, and he makes it out of clay, and they're the most beautiful little bottles that I, I mean, I just wish I could make something that, that looks as cool as that. And I find those, they make them in little hidden spots where they don't get rained on. And I find them in my wood pile sometimes and, and just love it. I've never fired one. And I, everybody says, have you fired them? Uh, and no, I have never fired one. And, but I'm going to. If I remember when I'm loading, I'm going to pick one off the, where, where I have them on display and, and put it in the kiln. Uh, that's my wife and my son. I always 
try to show a picture of my family because I miss them and if they weren't so kind with me and my time, I wouldn't be here right now. And he just got into junior high school. He went and looked at that board and saw that his number, after taking a grueling test and studying a grueling schedule, he, uh, we came here this day and they post the numbers of who get it, got in and his number was up there, so we're all smiles there. And that's my mom and dad. My mom's still with me. She's 86 uh, or seven. Uh, and my dad passed a couple years ago, and that was on their 50th wedding anniversary uh, at our summer home in Michigan. And my mom's still a trooper. She comes to Japan every year. She, uh, she'll be coming over for the opening of this new studio in April, and she just hangs with us. She stokes the kiln once in a while. She's, she's a real trooper and a lot of fun to be around. Um, and that is the end of the slide portion. I am going to play a short video, and, and after that I'll open it up for questions if anybody has any. Give me just a second to find this thing. Oh, yeah, let's do
much wraps it up. Uh, we're here for an hour. Do, uh, any questions? Do, do we have time to do that or do we need to wrap it up here? Do I still need to use this or are we still recording? Still recording? Okay. Okay. Any questions? Clay? Uh, most of my clay comes from Shigaraki, which is one of the, as I mentioned, one of the big clay towns in, uh, let me clip this back on, one of the big clay towns in uh, Japan, and it's probably the biggest source of clay in the country. So people go there for clay, and they've got a huge range of clays. They tend to have a lot more unrefined clays, where I think the clays that you get here in America, to me, feel like such um, I don't know, refined, you know, wonderful clays. We get things there that, you know, have stones in it that big. You can get a whole range of, of, of types of clays there. Yeah, there is, though I think that most Japanese would say that I don't make traditional based ceramics. They, they, and I don't really try to. I've never tried really hard to get into the, the tea community or the Ikebana community. I like making those things. I have friends who study it. But often you'll be asked in Japan, um, what, the question is nani nani yaki, and yaki means fired and really means pottery. And they say, what kind of pottery do you make? And they want to hear tamba yaki, bizen yaki, shigaraki yaki. They want to hear something that, that they can latch on to. That they, they, and mine isn't. I happen to be in the tamba area, but my pots aren't based on anything that, that's done in tamba. My clay comes from shigaraki. I studied in bizen. I didn't even say that before. I spent two years working with a potter in, in, in Bizen, which is another pottery town that's all about wood fire with no glaze. I use Shino glazes, I use other glazes. So I'm, I incorporate a lot of different things that I, and, and through that, I've always sort of kept myself, not distant, but not completely in with, with uh, and, and that's great for the Japanese. They, you know, I, I'm not pigeonholed anywhere. And I'm also, I think I'm, I'm appreciated. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Any theories of why there are stalls at the upper end? Boy, we have more theories than, than I, I uh, that's all we do is theorize when, when we cannot get that last 50, 100 degrees. And the, the common ideas are the kiln's not stacked very well. The stoking pattern isn't the way it isn't, we haven't figured it out right. The draft is, is not correct. We need to pull the damper a little bit or let a little bit more air. There's so many different variables that go into a kiln that I think only through firing them over and over again do you sort of develop and you learn patterns that work. Because at the beginning, almost everybody struggles at those end temperatures with, with a kiln. And just through repeating things that work, 
does it then work during the firing? If that answers the question. Yeah, do, am I purely an Anagama fire or do I fire other kilns? I only have an Anagama, so that is really the only thing that I ever fire, except that I do do workshops like this at least once a year, sometimes twice a year, where I get to fire other types of kilns, typically here in America. Um, but that Anagama is the only kiln that I have. Casey? Here it seems like we, uh, like the contemporary studio potters have a pretty good sense of what's going on in Japan and some other countries where there's the active striving scene. Is that the same there? Are, are like working Japanese potters even in Iowa or if you go to the head chair? <laughs> Do you, are, are Japanese potters aware of other countries' potters? I would say the answer is mostly no. Uh, Young people do get it, and a few people do know that there's an outside world, but Japan's a very insular country. And I'm often asked, is there clay in America? Uh, are there potters in America? And, you know, I roll my eyes and, and scratch my head and think, geez. Um, but on the other side, I mean, there's incredible awareness of ceramics in Japan. I can be at a gas station where the guy pumping my gas will look in the back of my car and see pots, and he goes, oh, is that bizan, or is it, it looks kind of like shigaraki. And you know, the guy pumping my gas, he, he has an idea of ceramics and knows the difference between different styles of pottery. But they know mysen, they know wedgewood, that is their idea of, of foreign ceramics or European ceramics. America, they don't know anything, uh, for the most part. There are people, and a lot, many potters will travel to America. They'll be invited to come over to teach. Um, but I would say that for the most part, they, there's not a huge recognition of, of potters outside of Japan. Well, all right, let's call it a day. Uh, thank you, everybody. Sutter, Casey, and Rob, thank you so, so much for making this happen. Paul, thank you as well for, for allowing me to come here and speak. And thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. Today.